Tonight we're in Nahum chapter 2. And we're going to continue our look at the, uh, the prophecies to the Assyrians living in the city of Nineveh. And last time that we were together for this study, we studied Nahum's five reminders of what God was like and what he planned to do to the city of Nineveh. And tonight in Nahum chapter 2, we read about the view that Nahum had of Nineveh's destruction, of Nineveh's demise. And we have to keep in mind that as we read through Nahum chapter 2 tonight, that what we read came about 40 to 50 years after Nahum wrote. Okay, so Nahum wrote 40 to 50 years before the destruction of Nineveh. And so uh, at that time, in 40 to 50 years before their destruction, the Assyrians were a world superpower. They had the world's biggest and baddest army. There in the Middle East, there was no comparison to the Assyrian army. People trembled in fear at the fact the Assyrians may just show up on their doorsteps one day. They were a very scary bunch of people. Uh, That's the only way to uh, put it. And as Nahum shared his prophecy of what God uh, had planned for them, many people probably thought that Nahum was just off his rocker, that he had to be crazy. Because as I've read in this one commentary, there wasn't a dark cloud in the sky for the Assyrians whenever he was writing. Everything was still good. Everything was great. And they were still this big world superpower. And so Nahum's prophecy in chapter 2 is about the end of the Assyrian Empire. It's about the the demise of the Assyrians. And it is a view of what happened as the Babylonians and their allies uh, basically just started this three-year siege of Nineveh. This is, I mean, it was a very long siege in Nineveh before they uh, were destroyed, but that's where we're looking at uh, tonight. This past week, uh, the NCAA men's basketball tournament started, and uh, as you have probably heard on TV or looked at the brackets and saw, there are 60, there were, there were 68 teams that were vying for the opportunity to be the national champion. Uh, they were in the they're in the the brackets as we read. Well, teams like Duke and Carolina are, but we'll just leave it at that. Anyway, um, right, Paul? Is there? Oh, wait, it's State. Yeah, they're not in that. I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't even mention that. But I digress. I got to shut up because Carolina plays right now, and I would like to see the second half. I don't want to be changing a tire out there where somebody slashes it. <laughs> Nevertheless. Many people, and maybe even some of you, have completed a bracket and sort of said, okay, I think this team is going to beat this team and and boiled it down to a national champion and made the picks. And you hear about people talking about uh, those sort of things. And at the end of the tournament, you'll see, you'll know how many of those picks you got right. Uh, But did you know that the odds of picking every game right Every winner is one in 2.4 trillion, with a T. One in 2.4 trillion at the opportunity of making every uh, guess correct. But see, the odds are not in your favor at picking that right winner in this year's tournament based on making every right pick. But could you imagine if you did? If you had, if you picked every upset, as they talk about, if you picked every one to, you know, Villanova to get beat by Wisconsin, which has already been a big, uh, big to do. But could you imagine, you know, people would want to know what's your secret. They would want to know, how did you pick that? Are you a psychic? Did, you know, what was your inside, you know, information? That would be what they would be asking, you know, come April when the national champion is crowned. Well, if Nahum was alive in 612 B.C. when Assyria was wiped off the map by Babylon and uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and their allies, he would have been asked the same question. He would have been asked, what was your secret? How did you know this was going to happen? How did you know what would happen to all of these people? Are you psychic? 
What, are you a medium? That was the question that would have been asked. But see, God revealed to Nahum the details of the fall of Nineveh, the destruction of Nineveh, and he recorded them in the second chapter of his writing. And so that's what we're going to look at tonight. And the first thing we're going to look at is how in verses 1 through 4, he talks about the arrival of the enemy. Read with me in verses 1 through 4 of Nahum chapter 2. It says that he who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily, for the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his of preparation and the spears are brandished the chariots rage in the streets they jostle one another in the broad roads they seem like torches they run like lightning right here in verse one nahum tells of the arrival of the babylonians and their allies it was going to take more than just the babylonians to conquer Nineveh, but they had the Medes, they had the Scythians, they had other people groups helping them attack and destroy uh, Assyria. And the enemies of Assyria had already overtaken many of the conquered lands that Assyria had went and conquered outside of their own national borders. They had already reclaimed that land and now the Assyrians were basically uh, retreating towards the capital. They were retreating towards Nineveh. And so they were gradually getting pushed back closer and closer. And so they were forced from, uh, from their outreaches into uh, Nineveh. And many of them sought refuge inside of those 100 foot high walls that we've been talking about that surrounded Nineveh. There were some suburbs that, uh, they, as we would refer to them, that sort of were outside the city walls, the, the towns and villages that were right outside the city wall, but they were still considered there at Nineveh. And there were people that were gradually being pushed into them and then into the city. But Nahum warns them, he, sa- he warns the Ninevites, he says to man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, and fortify your power mightily. The enemy was advancing on the mighty capital of Nineveh and the city needed to prepare. They needed to be prepared. And as verse two shares, this impending judgment is all about the atrocities that the Assyrians had brought forth on Israel, that they had brought on the whole world. And so that was why they were receiving this judgment, just as a reminder for them. But as the enemies approached Nineveh, as they got closer to the walls around the great city, the people in the suburbs that I mentioned, what they did was they started to make their way inside the walls. They started to move inside the walls to seek protection. And as I mentioned earlier, there was a three-year siege in Nineveh. They had inside the walls, they had areas, if I remember right, they had areas for fields, uh, some fields to help provide grains and things like that. They had the Tigris River, flow, a, a branch of the Tigris River flowing through the city and through those mighty walls and had gates to keep the enemies out. And so they had water, they had food, and so usually they could withstand a siege and the enemy would just get tired and leave. And so they were trying to prepare for this. But from the, wild, from the top of the mighty walls of Nineveh, you could see into the suburbs, so to speak. And the enemies, the Babylonians and their allies, were running rampant in the streets right outside, the big, outside these massive walls. But see, that doesn't end well for them because even though they go in and they've got this water and they have this food, uh, eventually there is the fall of Nineveh. And that's what we read about in verses 5 through 10. And and Nahum tells us about it. He says there, read along with me, beginning in verse 5. It says, He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls and the defense is prepared. He's talking about the king of Assyria there. Okay, just so you know. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed she shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maidservant shall lead her as with the voice of doves, beating their breasts, 
Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spool of silver, take spool of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. See, in verse 5, what we see is that Nahum gives the view from the perspective of the Assyrian king, and I'm going to try to pronounce his name right. I'll probably butcher it, but Sensharshakun is the name of the king that was in Nineveh at the time of the siege. And he was in there when the city falls. You see, the Assyrians had fended off the attack of the Medes early on. And they had done a good job. They had defeated the Medes. They, they had fought back and the Medes were pretty well decimated at that point. And rather than strengthening their defenses like smart people would do, the Assyrians went to celebrating basically getting drunk and partying and revelry, they, that's what they were doing. Rather than strengthening their defenses, they were, they were celebrating. And that was part of their downfall. Because see, even there, Nahum describes in verse 5, when the drunken warriors are sent to go and fortify the, the walls, they were stumbling around because they were drunk rather than running and marching like heroic soldiers. And so he tells, you know, they're not disciplined soldiers at this point. They're just a bunch of drunks falling around, not doing their job. But see, in verse 6, you read a total of 12 words in the New International Version. In the NIV, I don't know about other translations, there is a total of 12 words that describe the fall of the once great Assyrian Empire. Right there in verse 6, it says, The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace is dissolved. Basically, the, the Syrian empire was destroyed at that point. And it tells us about that. And as I mentioned earlier, that branch of the Tigris River that ran through the city of Nineveh, uh, it came through there. And where those gates were, as we see, uh, the gates, something happened with the gates. They think that because of the flood that is mentioned in uh, Nahum chapter 1, the, the flood that God says he's going to use to destroy Nineveh, that flood somehow damaged the gates and either knocked them off their hinges, so to speak, uh, or damaged them to the point where the enemy was able to enter into the city. And because those gates were damaged, the Babylonians and their allies were able to come in, sack the city, kill the king, and as it says, the palace was dissolved. Basically, uh, the, the palace was no longer a palace. But suddenly what happens after Nineveh falls is that they were treated just like the, the countless cities and towns and villages that they had destroyed over the years. They were treated the same way. They were being ransacked. They were being looted. They were having people carried off into captivity just like they had done for hundreds of years. The massive amounts of gold that we read about there, the gold and the silver, and the treasures that had been amassed by the Assyrians uh, were hauled off. They were taken to Babylon. They were taken to Persia. They were taken to Scythia. And they were distributed amongst Babylon and their allies. But see, verse 10 gives us a pretty good idea of the aftermath of the fall of Nineveh. It says that she is empty, desolate, and waste. Other translations may say empty and void and waste. But basically, it was a ghost town. I mean, that's the best way uh, to look at it. The city became very desolate, and uh, when you read about what happened with the city, those people that lived in the suburbs and lived in the city of Nineveh after the destruction of Nineveh, they just dispersed. They, nobody stayed in Nineveh. They left. They didn't try to rebuild. They didn't try to do anything like that, but they just left. One Bible commentator puts the desolation of Nineveh this way. He says this, and is this for, do we have this on the screen? The, the comment about Nahum? Oh, okay. Uh, I wasn't sure if I'd put that in there, but listen to what this uh, one Bible commentator says. He says, Nahum described Nineveh as empty and void and waste. The city was so completely ruined by the invaders that Xenophon, a Greek historian who came about 250 years later, 
scarcely recognized the site. So less than 250 years later, basically the same, nearly the same age as our country, that's how long ago it would have been, that entire city was gone. It, it wasn't even recognized. Alexander the Great, nearly 300 years later, after the fall of Nineveh, marched his men past the location and is quoted as not knowing that a world empire was buried beneath his feet. The British historian back in the 16 or 1700s, Edward Gibbon, confirmed that even the ruins of Nineveh had disappeared. So even by that time, you know, just a few hundred years ago, this, the city was completely disappeared. And it was not until Layard and Bota uh, identified the site in 1842 that the city was rediscovered by the modern world. That was 2,454 years after the destruction of Nineveh. More than 2,400 years this place was wiped off the map. That's how desolate the city of Nineveh become because of the destruction of the Babylonians and their allies, but more importantly because of the judgment of God. That's what brought that desolation because that's what God had promised. His judgment against Nineveh was complete. It was wholesale judgment and destruction in Nineveh and God didn't hold back. He warned them that he would not, and he didn't. But see, that doesn't end that Nahum chapter 2. That would be a good place for him to end, but he didn't. Uh, in verses 11 through 13, we see where he tells how the Assyrians were mocked. Look at verses 11 through 13. He says, Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion walked, the lioness and lion's cub... And no one made them afraid. The lion tore in pieces enough for his cubs, killed for his lionesses, and filled his caves with prey and his dens with flesh. Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. In the Assyrian culture, this is not something that you pick up from the, from the scriptures, but in the Assyrian culture, the lion held a place of prominence. Uh, it was a, a very big part of their culture. Uh, many of their ruins depicted lions, uh, and the Assyrian army was oftentimes referred to as a devouring lion type of creature, uh, or devouring their enemies as a lion would its prey. Today, we would say that for the Assyrians, their national symbol was a lion, where ours is a bald eagle. Uh, that's the same kind of symbolism that we would understand uh, from our own culture. But after the fall of Nineveh, that's when the taunting and the mocking of the once great empire began. The question that was basically being asked is, where is the lion of Assyria now? Where is that massive lion that had done so much? See, lions, here's an interesting thing too that you don't get from the scriptures. Uh, but lions, when killing their prey, oftentimes they will drag their prey back to their caves uh, so that their lionesses and their cubs uh, are able to uh, enjoy the food there and that they in the safety of a cave and things like that. But the thing is, lions don't stockpile their kills. They only kill enough for their, basically for their family or for their family unit, and they eat it, and then when they're hungry again, they go and do the same thing over. They bring the food back, and uh, it's eaten by the entire group. But as verse 12 tells us, the Assyrians, the lion of Assyria, had done something different. They had taken much more than what they needed from the cities and towns and villages that they attacked. They stockpiled hordes of gold and silver and treasures from all of these places that they had conquered, all of these places that they had uh, ransacked. And they, they did differently than a true lion would have. And that's part of what the mocking is that goes on here. But verse 13 tells us of God's wrath and judgment against the brutal Assyrians. He told them, he says, behold, I am against you. Could you imagine, I mean, for I, as a Christian, we hope that we would never hear that kind of judgment coming from God. For him to look at us and say, behold, I am against you. Because this is the God of the universe that if his judgment went un, 
unrestrained. He could wholesale destroy all of the universe in an instant. He could, I mean, if, his, if God sought to do that because of how powerful he is. And here, this, this once mighty nation is being told by God, behold, I am against you. So it's no wonder that they were a, a desolation and, they, and not rebuilt for 2,400 years. Because that's what God's judgment was. He brought his judgment and he wiped them off the map, literally, for two and a half millennia. And that's because of the power of God, because of his judgment. You know, it didn't matter how much wealth the Ninevites had hoarded up inside the city walls of Nineveh. It didn't matter how much they had. God was against them and brought judgment to bear against them. He was against them because of the atrocities that they had brought against Israel and even trying to get into Jerusalem in Judah. But God said, look, enough is enough. I gave you an opportunity to repent with Jonah. You didn't. And now I'm bringing, uh, you did at the time, but it didn't last. And now I'm not giving you another chance. I'm going to bring judgment. And that's what God did. He told them, <clears throat> he said there in, that, uh, in verse, uh, I want to make sure I give you the right verse. He told them in verse 13, he says, I will burn your chariots and smoke and the sword shall devour your young lions, obviously meaning the young Assyrians. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. I mean, that's exactly what they experienced. They experienced defeat, death, and destruction. I mean, that's, that's what God's judgment was for the city of Nineveh. That's what it was for the, the capital of this once great Assyrian army. And that's a great opportunity for us to look at, at what happened in world history and what we read in the Bible and to see the two mesh up. Now, there are people that will tell you that Nahum wrote after the time of the Assyrian fall, and that's why he was able to give you such a good description of what happened to the Assyrians. But here's the catch. Because it's a prophecy in God's word, that means that it was written before the time of the fall of Nineveh. See, when we study through chapter 2 of Nahum, we want to keep the, the understanding of, of how Nahum affects us today. That's what we want to do through this whole study. Uh, and it's easy for us as we study chapter 2 to lose our perspective. It's easy for us to view this as a history lesson rather than a future lesson. Let that sink in for a minute. It's easier for us to see this as a history lesson than a future lesson, because that's really what this is. It's a prophecy, meaning it's a future lesson for the people in Nineveh, the people in Israel at that time. Nahum's details of the fall of Nineveh line up perfectly with what is recorded in world history, so much so that that's why people doubt that it was a prophecy. That's why they doubt that God gave it to him ahead of time. Nahum was able to fill in the brackets beforehand and he knew what was going to happen and people doubted it even then i'm sure <coughs> doubted that what he said would come to fruition you see many look at the bible and completely dismiss it there's plenty of people in this world that look at the bible and dismiss it as a bunch of myths a bunch of lessons a lot of moral of the story type uh, occurrences that we can take and learn from. And yeah, if you apply some of these things to your life, it, it's a good self-help book. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people in this life that uh, think it's completely a work of history and, and there's no prophecy to it at all. That's the way people, unfortunately, in our society have uh, viewed the Bible because they're cynical towards it for whatever reason. But what we must do from the Christian perspective so that Nahum can impact us today is we need to keep the truths of God's word in their proper perspective. Keep them in the proper perspective as we try to live them out because the truths of the Bible were important in the day that Nahum wrote this. 40 or 50 years before the fall of Assyria, before the fall of Nineveh, these truths that we read about in the book of Nahum were very important because we're seeing that God brings judgment against sin, that God brings judgment against idolatry, that God brings his judgment, and when God says he's going to bring judgment, it may to us seem it's delayed, but it's not. 
But God brings his judgment and God holds to his word. And that's what we need to understand. That those truths were true 40 or 50 years before the fall of Nineveh. They were true in 612 BC when Nineveh fell and the Babylonians overrun the gates. And it was as true today as we just read it through this Bible study. The truths of God's word do not change according to history. Regardless of what our society tries to say to update the view on things like marriage and sexuality and all sorts of different things that we read about in the news every day, the truths of God's word do not change regardless if it was two and a half millennia ago or whether it was two weeks ago. God's word is the same. And we have to keep that same perspective. We have to keep God's truths in a proper perspective, not allowing our views to change what we believe about God's word, but allowing God's word to change our views about what we believe. That's the way it ought to work. And we have to keep it in that proper perspective. See, those truths that we're talking about are important in the day in which we live. And not only today, but into the future. That young lady that was baptized today, I, 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 I dread to see the world that, that she raises kids in because I, you know, the world that I'm raising my kids in is nowhere near the world I, ra I was raised in. And I, I fear for her kids and, the, the, and all the kids that will be born in that time frame because of the world that, that we'll be living in. Because sin will be even more commonplace than it is today. It will be more rampant. Idolatry and all the things that come along with a sinful lifestyle, all of that will be that much worse. And so it's, uh, it's scary to think about what, uh, what they will face. But the truths of God's word are as important today as they were in Nahum's time and just as important as they'll be in the days of these children that we're talking about. When we keep the truths of God's word in their proper perspective like we're talking about, we keep ourselves from falling into the idolatrous and sinful ways just like the Assyrians did. Because when we keep God's word in its proper place and we allow it to impact our lives rather than us trying to impact our understanding of faith, what we see is that it keeps us from falling into sin. It keeps us from making poor choices that lead us farther away from God. And when we keep ourselves from those sinful ways, when we keep ourselves from those things, what we see is that we avoid God's judgment. We avoid the Lord's judgment and Him having to look at us and tell us like He did the Assyrians, Behold, I am against you. So it's important that we keep our understanding of of the truths of God's word in a proper perspective so that we allow his word to impact our lives rather than our lives impacting the way that we view our faith. Because his word is unchanging, his promises are unchanging, and when, as we've saw through, or seen through this entire study, we've seen how a lot of times with these Old Testament prophets, they're pointing towards the end times. And God has promised judgment in the end times just as much as he promised judgment for Nineveh. And even though it may seem like it's a long time coming, even though it may seem like God is delaying in returning or sending Christ back, we know that God is going to be faithful. We know that he is going to send him back. We know that because of what his word has promised us, there will be that judgment. There will be that opportunity for God to send Christ back and uh, rescue us from this world and rapture us into heaven with him. And so that is the end of tonight's study with uh, the book of Nahum chapter 2.